These creepy missing person cases all feature families desperate for answers about their missing loved ones. No matter what the circumstances of the individual or how they vanished, they all deserve to have their stories told and for the endings of those stories to be known. Number 5 Aiden Spear was preparing to get her life back on track when she vanished without a trace on January 24th, 2022. At first, her mother didn't realize she was missing, but when none of Aiden's friends had seen or heard from her in weeks, it became clear that something was seriously wrong. Growing up, Aiden had been a bright but shy child. Her mother, Jessica, was just 19 years old when Aiden was born and broke up with Aiden's biological father when Aiden was still young. Jessica later married Aiden's stepfather and they had a son together, but Aiden was always part of the family. The family moved to Tacoma, Washington, on the other side of the state to Jessica's parents. It was a rougher area and Aiden struggled to make friends when she started high school. She was part of the swim team and took part in extracurricular activities, but it didn't stop the bullying. It was at this point that Aiden started to hang out with people who would turn out to be bad influences. Jessica also believed her daughter was suffering from mental health problems, which may have contributed to her spiral. Aiden started drinking and using illegal substances. Jessica attempted to get her help multiple times, but unfortunately there was little that could be done when Aiden didn't want the help. Four years before her disappearance, Aiden left the family home. Her mother always made it clear that she was welcome back at any time, but she needed to get clean first. It wasn't safe for Aiden to be at home, especially with her younger brother. But over the next four years, Aiden kept in touch with her mother and the rest of her family. Jessica claimed that Aiden wouldn't ask for money, but would occasionally ask if they could go out and get food together. She kept Jessica informed about her life and told her mother about boyfriends and friends that she spoke to while homeless. Naturally, given Aiden's lifestyle, there were times when she would drop off the radar. She didn't have a cell phone. Whenever she bought a cell phone, it would be quickly stolen. Her main method of communication was Facebook Messenger, which she would use on borrowed phones. It was only when Jessica didn't hear from her daughter for a few days or weeks that she began to get worried. She would go to Hosmer Street, a street in Tacoma known for its crime and homelessness, and ask about her daughter. She would always meet someone that knew Aiden and within days, Aiden would get in contact with her one way or another, just to let her know that she was alright. It was far from ideal and Jessica always hoped Aiden would take her up on the offer to go into rehab. In January of 2022, it seemed that would finally happen. On January 21st, Aiden contacted Jessica asking for her birth certificate and social security number. She wanted to get an ID so that she could work towards getting her life together. Jessica agreed to meet up with Aiden so that they could deal with the ID issue together. Over lunch, Aiden admitted that she couldn't keep up her lifestyle forever and asked for her mother's help getting clean. They looked at rehab centers and together agreed on one in Texas that would be suitable for Aiden's needs. They made plans to meet again on the following Monday. At 7.30 a.m. on Monday the 24th, Aiden sent her mother a message confirming that she wanted to go ahead with the rehab plan. Jessica was under the impression that Aiden was serious about this and hoped this would be the beginning of the end of the nightmare. But three hours later, Aiden sent another message. They were due to meet at 11 a.m., but Aiden told her mother that she would be late. She insisted she still wanted to go ahead with the rehab plan, but she needed to say goodbye to someone first. Jessica tried to tell Aiden that she would take her to say goodbye to this person, but Aiden wouldn't listen. She simply said that she would call her later, and that call never came. That evening, Jessica sent Aiden a message, warning her that her friends would take her life over illegal substances and that she needed to call the rehab center. The message was seen but received no response. After that, Jessica assumed Aiden was purposefully avoiding her. She naturally was very angry and Aiden would have known that she disappointed her mother. Days and weeks passed with no word from Aiden. Then Jessica received a strange call. The call came from a friend who also lived on the streets. The friend saw Aiden almost every day, but she hadn't seen her since the 24th. The last they had heard, Aiden was going to rehab. She just wanted to check in and see how that was going. It was only then that Jessica realized Aiden was actually missing. Looking at Aiden's messages, it was clear that she had every intention of going to Texas and to rehab. 
she had told multiple friends that she would be getting her life back. The day she went missing, she was asking people if they knew where her boyfriend Dre was. Aiden had been seeing Dre for a while. Jessica knew about him and he was violent towards her, but it seemed like he was the person that Aiden wanted to say goodbye to. But Dre might not have been the only person Aiden saw the day she vanished. A number of people claimed that she had been spending time with a man named Patrick Detweiler. When Jessica contacted him, he told her a long story about being in love with Aiden and that Dre had found out about their relationship and convinced Aiden to rob him. However, Deadweiler had no proof that he had ever spoken with Aiden, and Aiden had never mentioned him to her mother. Another name that came up was Michael Moore, the last person Aiden messaged while searching for Dre. He claimed he didn't know where Dre was, but asked if Aiden had any substances. They agreed to meet up at an abandoned Howard Johnson Hotel. The hotel had long been another hotspot for crime and had closed down. When Jessica went to search the hotel, she found it boarded up and impossible to enter. There's currently construction work going on at the hotel with plans to build houses on the site. No trace of Aiden has been found since she vanished. Dre has cooperated with the police, but the other two men in the case have been less responsive. Deadweiler contacted the police a few times, with claims that Aiden's body could be found on an abandoned airfield, but he refused to come in for questioning himself. Foul play is suspected in this case, but it's possible that the suspect isn't anybody any of Aiden's friends or family knew by name. Aiden led a risky lifestyle and did what she needed to do in order to fund it. Aiden's loved ones feared that she told the wrong person that she was escaping that life, and they put a stop to it. Anyone with information on the case can contact the Pierce County Sheriff's Department at 253-798-7530. Number 4. Antonio Vela Jr. was well-known and well-liked in the small town of Victoria, Texas. So when he disappeared, there were no clear motives or explanations about what could have happened to him. Five years later, it's likely someone in that same community knows what happened to Antonio, but there's been no update since he first vanished without a trace. Antonio was a music producer and freestyle rapper working on building his career and helping others do the same. He loved music and was willing to help out anybody who was interested in creating their own music. He had worked odd jobs in his 20s to fund his music and was now working towards buying a house in Victoria, the town where he had grown up. His loved ones described him as friendly and someone who would always say hello to everyone, but he also wasn't someone afraid to defend someone in need of help. He was close with his family, but especially his father, who he was named after. He was the youngest of his parents' three children and the only boy, so he was well looked after. So when Antonio wouldn't answer phone calls after June 15th, 2017, his family was certain something was wrong. There was no world in which Antonio wouldn't get back to them if he could. The last time anybody had seen or heard from Antonio was at about 2 a.m. on June 15th. Earlier that evening, he'd gone to a small bar at a strip club in Victoria had a few drinks, and then visited Sports, another larger bar. Sports was one of the places Antonio would hang out at often. He was a regular at the bar and knew all the bar staff and most of the customers. That night, it was fairly quiet, but Antonio stayed until the final call, chatting with the people who were there and the bartender, a friend named Andrew Gonzalez Crail. Andrew noticed nothing out of the ordinary about his friend, and he could never have imagined that would be the last time that he saw him. At approximately 1.45 a.m., just before closing, Antonio told his friend he was going to pick up some food and then head home. This was a little bit unusual. Antonio would usually stay until after closing and help clean up or play the piano for the staff members. But it was nothing that would have been noticed as weird if Antonio hadn't then vanished. That morning, when his roommate woke up, Antonio wasn't home. The roommate went through the garage to take out the trash as he went to work and noticed that the garage door was open. Antonio's car was missing, and his phone and a plastic bag of food were found on the floor, as if Antonio had dropped them as he exited his vehicle. The roommate was someone Antonio had known for a long time, who was practically part of the Vela family. He called Antonio's parents to let them know about the strange scene in the garage, which only confirmed to them that something was very wrong. Antonio's family reported him missing the same day, and began to search themselves for their missing loved one. Pictures of Antonio and a description of his car were posted to social media, 
and his sister drove around Victoria, searching parking lots for his car. The next day, a friend would message Antonio's sister with the photo of Antonio's car. It had been abandoned just outside Victoria on a dirt road. There was nothing around but fields of corn and cotton. It was approximately 16 miles from Antonio's home. When the family arrived, they found nothing especially out of the ordinary about the vehicle itself, other than the fact that it had a flat tire and the seat was pulled forward, as if for someone much shorter than Antonio. There was no sign of a struggle and no other obvious clues. When it came to official information, there isn't much else in this creepy disappearance. The local police are investigating the case but haven't released any information to the public. Even whether or not Antonio's roommate actually found Antonio's phone hasn't been confirmed by the police. But there are a lot of rumors and people who claim to have information. One of those is an individual who claimed to be at the bar the night that Antonio disappeared. At one point during the night, Antonio was approached by a woman and they chatted for a bit. A few minutes later, the man the woman had been with came over and talked to Antonio. According to this person, it was shortly after that interaction that Antonio left the bar, and the couple left not long after. Other sources claim the store that Antonio visited on his way home was the Cimarron Express, a store that wasn't far from Antonio's home. While there, he called his roommate to ask if he wanted anything picked up. Antonio's roommate hasn't been named in the media, and it's not clear if he's confirmed or denied if that call took place. The police also haven't confirmed this information, but if Antonio's roommate was awake, it means whatever happened to him was likely very quiet. According to Antonio's loved ones, they know of nobody that would want to hurt him and no motive that anybody could have. However, comments online suggest that Antonio might have been involved in illegal activity. Anonymous commenters have claimed that Antonio distributed illegal substances or may have known about a large sum of money and talk to the wrong person about it. Some have suggested he got in trouble for going to the police about the cartel. There's no evidence that Antonio was involved in any sort of crime. In general, it would be unwise to believe anonymous people on the internet, but it's hard to know if these people were spreading these false accusations just to be cruel, or if they were trying to discredit Antonio's character and cover up for what really happened. Whatever happened to Antonio, it's almost certain that someone in Victoria knows more than they've said. Five years have passed, and as relationships change, investigators hope that somebody might finally come forward with the clue they need to solve this case and bring Antonio home. Antonio is described as being six foot tall and weighing 185 pounds. He has several tattoos, including a Nintendo game controller and a microphone on his left arm, a tattoo of his father on his chest, and angel wings and a woman on his back. He was last seen wearing a gray t-shirt, jeans, and black and white Nike sneakers. Anybody with information can contact Victoria Police at 361-485-3700 or Crime Stoppers at 361-572-4200. Number 3. On September 25th, 2013, Senji Kundi said goodbye to his parents and said that he would see them in a week. He was going on a spontaneous trip to Paris, one he had only planned a few days before to see the sights and some of the galleries. His family would never see him again. It had been a difficult few years for Senji. In the mid-2000s, he lost his job and struggled to make the payments for his bills. He moved back in with his parents who lived in England while he tried to get himself back on his feet. That wasn't an easy task given the economy at the time, and Sanjeev began to suffer from health problems. He was prescribed medication as a result. But over the years, things gradually got better. According to his family, in 2013, his medication was reduced and he seemed to be back to his old self. In mid-September, he took a day trip to London. It was the London Fashion Week and Sanjeev had always been interested in fashion as well as art in general. His family believes he may have been trying to get caught up in the festivities at the time. The trip to London seemed to trigger a need for adventure in Sanji. He wanted to go further afield. Only a few days after returning from London, he booked a train ticket to Paris. It was surprising behavior for Sanji, but behavior that his family hoped was part of his mental health improvements that they'd been seeing over the past year. The trip was booked for only a few days later. Sanji apparently didn't want to waste any time and he seemed really excited about the trip, and his parents were excited for him. 
Early on the morning of September 25th, Sanjeev said goodbye to his parents and took off. He had told his parents he would only be gone a week, but didn't give them any details about the time that he would be back. A week passed and there was no sign of Sanjeev returning home. At first, his parents tried to believe that he just decided to stay longer, but eventually they had to admit that he had disappeared. He was reported missing on October 15th, nearly three weeks after he was last seen. The police were able to get CCTV footage from St. Pancras that captured Sanjeev going through the gates at the station. He was also caught on camera in Paris. That was at 8 p.m. on the evening that he vanished. There was one more sighting after this. Sanjeev had apparently only booked a single ticket to Paris. However, the day after he disappeared, there was a sighting of Sanjeev back at the Paris station. He went to the Eurostar desk to buy a ticket back to London for seven days time and paid in cash. It was as if he had decided to wait until he got to Paris before deciding how long he was going to stay, or possibly he didn't have the money to buy the return ticket at the start of his trip. Whatever the reason for buying the ticket separately, Sanjeev didn't board the train back to London at the end of the week. His family has traveled to Paris multiple times to try to get to the bottom of this mystery. They visited hospitals, hostels, and tourist locations, hoping someone might have seen Sanjeev. His sister described him as being between 6 foot 1 and 6 foot 2, with broad shoulders and likely would have stood out. The people on the train to Paris remembered seeing Sanjeev. He kept to himself during the trip and didn't seem to have any luggage with him. But once he arrived in Paris, his family have no idea where he went or where he stayed. There are lots of unanswered questions in this strange case. In particular, the timeline for Sanjeev's journey to Paris doesn't quite add up. In total, it should have taken about five hours for Sanjeev to get to Paris. Even scheduling in time to account for any delays or security problems, Sanjeev wouldn't have needed to leave Leamington as early as he did. It's worth noting, if Sanjeev had caught a train heading to London in the early morning, the ticket likely would have been more expensive than if he had gone after the main commuter rush. It's unlikely that Sanjeev booked the earlier train to London to try to save money. His family believes he may have met up with someone while in London. When they heard about his spontaneous trip to Paris, they had no reason to suspect anything sinister about the journey. But now, his family wonders if he met someone in London during that first day trip, who convinced Sanjeev to come to Paris. It might have been the promise of a job in France, or maybe even something more personal. Sanjeev had jumped at the opportunity, but then something had happened in Paris which had stopped him from coming home. But even if that was the case, Sanjeev would have taken his luggage with him, unless he planned on buying clothes for the trip while in Paris. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Warwickshire Police on 101 or from outside the UK on 0044-1926-41500. Number 2 The disappearance of Brian Worrell is one of the strangest unsolved disappearances. The early investigation was hindered by mistakes from the police, and more than 10 years on, the truth about what happened to Brian remains unknown. Brian was 39 years old at the time of his disappearance. He lived in Atlanta, Georgia with his long-term partner, Jeff Rolstead, but was in Carrollton at the time of his disappearance. Brian had arrived in the town the day before he disappeared for a meeting at the local probate court. He had power of attorney for his elderly mother who was suffering from dementia, he had previously cared for her himself, but she had recently been moved into assisted living so she could get the level of care that she needed. On September 24, 2009, Brian was due in court to hand over some receipts in relation to his role in her care. It was an important meeting, one that he'd driven four hours through heavy flooding to attend. But the day after the meeting, Brian's sister received a call to say that he hadn't shown up. His sister hadn't been able to get a hold of Brian and when she went to their parents' house where Brian was staying, there was no sign of him. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. Brian's family began to piece together his last known whereabouts. He had had dinner with the relative the night before, then headed back to the house where he called Jeff. They talked on the phone for about 45 minutes, with the call ending at 9.15 p.m. He had also called his niece at some point that night and left a voicemail, but didn't answer when she called him back. Brian's call to Jeff, who was back in Atlanta, was the last time anybody had heard from him. All of Brian's belongings were found at their parents' home. That included his phone, medication, and all his clothes. 
the only things missing were his car and wallet, and Brian himself. Jeff tried to file a missing person report as soon as he learned his partner was missing, but the police insisted he had to wait 72 hours. His sister was finally able to get the report filed on Friday, October 2nd, but it wasn't until the following day that Brian's information was entered into any databases. A be on the lookout was also put out for the car, a light blue 1992 Buick LeSabre. The police eventually began to investigate seriously, going to the house and interviewing the neighbors. One of the neighbors who knew the Whirl family reported seeing Brian at 2 a.m. on September 24th, roughly five hours after his last phone call. The garage light was on, and a figure who was assumed to be Brian was spotted inside, apparently looking for something. The neighbor didn't see anything too strange. Brian suffered from insomnia, and it wasn't unusual for him to be doing tasks or running errands at odd times. The neighbor couldn't say for sure if it was Brian, just because of the distance and poor lighting, but he had no reason to believe that it was anybody else. The following morning, the neighbor left for work between 8 and 8.30 a.m., and the car was gone. This pushed back the time that Brian was last seen, but didn't give the police any more clues about what might have happened to him. Early in the investigation, there were a few dead ends and incorrect information that led police in the wrong direction. For example, Brian had gone to the town hall to pay for his parents' water bill. The water company had dated that as September 24th, the day Brian was last seen. If that was accurate, it meant that Brian had gone into the town center next to the court but hadn't met his appointment there. But then it turned out Brian had actually paid the water bill the day before, and the date had been marked incorrectly. For months, there was little action in the case. Brian's loved ones continued to search for him in the surrounding area and grew more and more frustrated by an apparent lack of interest from the police. Then in December, there was finally a clue that pushed the case forward. On December 22nd, a resident in Chattanooga, Tennessee reported a car that matched the description of one used in a robbery. The police arrived on the residential street to find a light blue Buick. It was sitting under a tree and had obviously been parked there for a long time. The plates on the car were stolen and didn't match the vehicle. The car was Brian's and had been parked there for at least a month. One resident described the person who parked it there as a young black man who she didn't recognize. None of the residents reported the car as they all believed it belonged to somebody else. Inside the car, investigators found the keys still in the ignition and a book Brian had been reading on the passenger seat along with the receipt for a Taco Bell Brian had been to before he went missing. In the back seat, there was glass from a burglary that had happened before Brian went missing. Nothing about the car was any different from when Brian had last been seen, other than its location. Investigators recovered fibers and a partial fingerprint, but it wasn't one that could be put into any databases. Unfortunately, the police found nothing that could lead them to Brian. The police theorized that Brian had left willingly, they believed he had decided to abandon his life, leave his long-term partner, and start again. Even if this wasn't completely out of character for Brian, he left behind the medication that he would have needed to survive. His family believed foul play was certain. This time, the case lay cold for years. It wasn't until new investigators took over that there was any kind of movement. A psychic was brought to the Whirl family home and claimed that she'd gotten bad energy from beneath the back porch. Sniffer dogs were brought in and all pointed to the boathouse on the property. But when police searched the boathouse and the lake, there was no sign of Brian. So far, the only other clue that has come up was one that should have been discovered early in the investigation. Brian's car was found, but the plates were never recovered. Later, investigators decided to see if anybody had run the plates since Brian vanished. They discovered the police in Georgia had run a scan on the license plate in October of 2009. This was before Brian's car was even found, but after the bolo was sent out. This was an alert that police would have received, but for some reason they didn't make the connection with Brian's missing person case, and investigators on the case never learned about the sighting. Why the plates were run also remains a mystery. There are too many unanswered questions in this strange missing person case, in part due to the problems early in the investigation, but Brian's family has continued to push for answers. Anyone with information can contact the Carrollton Police Department at 770-834-4451. Number 1 Twelve years have passed since Jacob Cavanaugh disappeared after a game of frisbee golf in 2010. He left behind a girlfriend, 
two young sons, and a trail of evidence that led from Michigan to Texas. But after a two-day round trip, the trail went cold. There's been no trace of Jacob since. Jacob was 31 years old at the time of his disappearance and living with his mother in Traverse City, Michigan. He'd previously been married and had two young sons from that relationship. Jacob and his ex-wife had been divorced for about two years, but they still had a good relationship and were successfully co-parenting their children. According to friends, he was protective of his ex-wife and never had a bad word to say about her, even after they broke up. Despite the breakup, Jacob was in a good place in his life. He was taking classes at Northwestern Michigan College and was in the National Guard. He wanted to go into active military service, a career that some of his siblings had also gone into. He was also looking forward to starting a new class, which he hoped would help his career. He had a good job as a mechanic, a girlfriend, and a good relationship with his siblings and mother. March 31st, 2010 was a day that started out like any other. Jacob spent the day at work before going out with friends to play some frisbee golf and relax. The game ended at about 7.30 p.m., and Jacob drove one of his friends, Gary, to the volleyball courts at the open space in Traverse City, where Gary had parked his own car. Gary invited Jacob to join him in visiting some bars, but Jacob declined. He had a paper that was due soon and wanted to go home to work on it. Jacob left and was never seen again. It was a few days later when Jacob's loved ones realized that he was missing. Mail arrived stating that his card had been used in different states and he was in overdraft. When Jacob's friends and family couldn't get a hold of him on his cell phone, they realized something strange was going on. Jacob's bank and phone records told a story that didn't seem to make any sense. He did have a paper that he needed to write. Gary's offer of a night out wasn't the first that he had declined so he could go and work on his schoolwork, but he hadn't returned home that night. Instead, Jacob had driven through Missouri and Arkansas into Texas. His card was used a few times in Michigan, including a takeout at an ATM of $120. He then called an automated National Guard line at 2.30 a.m. on April 1st for his mandatory monthly check-in. At that point, Jacob was in Springfield, Missouri, and it was the last time his cell phone was used. After buying gas in Michigan, Jacob's card wasn't used again until Oklahoma on April 2nd, but there were a few traces of him on the night of April 2nd, as two police officers ran the plates on his car, once in Missouri and a second time in Arkansas. At 11.30 a.m. on April 2nd, Jacob tried to use his card at a convenience store in Oklahoma, but he didn't have enough funds for the transaction. A few hours later, he arrived in Fort Worth, Texas and used his card again to pay for gas. This time, the transaction went through due to Jacob's overdraft protection. It wouldn't have been possible for Jacob to make it from Michigan to Texas on one tank of gas. He presumably used the money from the ATM to pay for gas along the way, though some believe he might have had another person with him who paid to fill it up. The final bank transaction took place in Sweetwater, Texas, where Jacob paid for gas again. This time, his vehicle was captured on CCTV. He paid at the pump, which meant he didn't come into the store and the camera that showed Jacob's car was filming through the window inside the store. He was difficult to make out and Jacob's loved ones are split over whether the person filling up the car is actually Jacob. The figure is tall, like the missing man, and a friend pointed out that he placed his wallet in the exact same location that Jacob would. But he was also wearing cargo shorts, which Jacob didn't own. And not all of his family members are convinced the man in the CCTV footage was Jacob. Where Jacob went after he left the gas station in Sweetwater remains a mystery. On April 7th, the police began to investigate this strange missing person case, and there were a few possibilities that could have happened to Jacob, but none seemed to make any sense. Jacob was an adult when he vanished. He could have simply wanted to start again somewhere else. His journey gave investigators the impression that he had gone to Mexico. Jacob had left his passport at home when he disappeared and didn't have any of his belongings for a road trip. He didn't even have a phone charger. But years later, investigators discovered that the VIN for Jacob's car had been checked in Mexico. The time and place of that search couldn't be found, but investigators believed that it had been at a scrapyard. His vehicle had at least made it across the border. There were a number of problems with this theory, though. His family believes he would never have abandoned his sons, especially considering he knew how hard it could be growing up without a father. He had opportunities and a future in Michigan, but even if he didn't have anything tying him to the area, 
he left behind thousands of dollars worth of mechanics tools. If he was going to start a new life, he would have taken those tools with him. Another explanation could be that Jacob fell foul of some shady people. After a few petty crimes in his youth, Jacob had turned his life around and knew how any additions to his criminal record could hurt his chances in the military. But some of the people he hung around with don't seem to be as clean. Gary, the last person to see Jacob, also disappeared the weekend Jacob vanished. He came back a few days later but was defensive when asked about Jacob. According to Jacob's loved ones, he hadn't been as cooperative with police as he could have been. Gary also had another friend, a man named David. According to David's ex-girlfriend, David would often take trips from Michigan to Brownsville, Texas, where his family lived, and never allowed anybody else on these trips. He would also come into large amounts of cash whenever this happened. There's no evidence Jacob was involved in any of these schemes. Money wasn't a problem for him, even though he didn't have money in the bank at the time of his disappearance. He also notably headed in the opposite direction to Brownsville when he arrived in Texas. Anybody with information can contact Grand Traverse County Sheriff's Office at 231-995-5000. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.